thank you very much um, to uh, uh, Professor Jody Coromines and uh, Celeste Martinez for inviting me to be part of the third seminar on historical justice and colonialism. I've prepared my lecture as a lecture, so I hope you don't mind. Um, I apologize for not being there in person. Uh, as we collectively explore modalities uh, for addressing heritage and colonialism, I've titled my presentation today, Restitution and the Question of Ethicality, Postcolonial Museology and the Future of African Art in Post-Imperial Europe. I want to begin my presentation by talking about a wonderful festival called Dukas the Art. Every August in the town of Art, in Belgium, people gathered to celebrate David's victory over Goliath. This festival features a character that is called a savage, which is a white man clad in black costume, his face and hands covered in black paint, his head adorned with a feathered war bonnet, and a golden piercing protruding from his nose. With chains clanging from his neck, wrist, and ankles, he yells incomprehensible sounds, scares children, and leaves black paint on their faces. Now for UNESCO, the cast yard is a piece of intangible cultural heritage. For Belgians, as this Minister of Culture so wonderfully declared, the cast yard is a piece of cultural form, harmless cultural form. But if you look at it from the perspective of Africans, then you, you print a different view. The cast art perpetuates stereotypes of barbarity and primitivism projected on Africa during the slave trade and colonialism. Now, the cast art symbolizes the challenge we have today of balancing perspective on what we consider to be heritage on the past colonialism, nationalism, and ethicality, especially for cultural experts, those connected with ethnographic museums. Why specifically does this problem face, is, have so much emphasis within the museum space? This is because ethnographic museums are fascinating institutions with sophisticated taxonomies in the West. However, since the gaze is mediated by ideologism, museums are not innocent, which explains why they have recently become spaces for intense battles. The ambiguity of attempting to instill progressive thinking and at the same time preserving past hegemonies of empires and their legacies are factors that have led to the recent criticism of ethnographic museums. But understanding this criticism requires some context. There will be no European museums without empires and there will be no collections without colonialism. The British Museum, for example, was founded in 1753 but only became a relevant material repository when it started accumulating colonial loot, just as Le Musée Royal de l'Afrique Centrale in Belgium expanded in 1897 with ties to colonialism in Congo. The Ethnological Museum of Berlin rebranded as the Royal Museology Museum of Ethnology in 1886 also shares imperial ties. What we need to understand from an African perspective is that the expansion of museums after the Berlin Conference precipitated epistemicide against cultures outside Western Eurasia. Take the case of the splitting of the Pitt Rivers and the Ashmolean Museums in Oxford, for example, one to display European, European sophisticated civilization and the other objects from so-called degenerate or extinct cultures. It marked the colonization of knowledge through anthropology as museums became sites for authenticating cultural evolution theories that promoted white supremacy. The misconstrued narratives around African and other indigenous objects to materialize racism of the likes of Louisa Gazis, for example, who argued for the canonization of social inequality because he believed that the Negro race was inferior to whites, not to mention Frederick Hedrick, Hegel, his, with his theory that Negro, Negroes lack consciousness, subjectivity, and culture. This imperial ideology of racializing difference to assert authority 
was the impetus for various European removal of objects from Africa in the guise of so-called punitive expeditions. Abyssinia, in modern-day Ethiopia in 1868, the Ashanti, the Ashanti Kingdom in 1874, Cameroon and Congo in 1884, Mali in 1890, the Benin Kingdom in 1897, Guinea in 1898, and Tanzania in 1907. Museums and empires went hand in hand in the exploitation and dehumanization of the colonized. This explains why the American curator Hannah Mason Macklin argues that museums displayed wealth and power so that the artifacts on display became visual affirmation of oppression and the creation of fictional representations about the other. Now, this brings us to the question of restitution. This imperial entanglement of ethnographic museums, their collection is responsible for Africa's clamor for the decolonization of European museums, and for some, the return of some of the objects. Premise on Africa's agitations and the eagerness or the pretense of the eagerness to atone for the atro atrocities of the empires of England, Belgium, Germany, Holland, and France, restitution, that is the planned return of contested indigenous objects to former colonies, is floated to create a new kind of ethical relations. One cannot overstate the importance and significance of, res of restitution, because the presence of indigenous objects in Europe, whether they were looted or now commonly perceived as looted, forces indigenous of former colonies to endure the humiliating spectacle of experiencing their objects exhibited in animated suspense. By animated suspense, I mean exhibited out of the context of their creation. However, the question we need to ask ourselves is if restitution in its current format is succeeding. And the answer, of course, is no. Emmanuel Macron's 2017 political declaration in Burkina Faso that he wants to see all African art objects return to Africa, and the commissioning of his wonderful Sir and Sir, Sir and Savoy report, credited for amplifying contemporary restriction dialogues, have opened a Pandora's box in Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, what we see is a cohort of politicians, cultural experts, art critics, historians, all attempting to realize restitution from political, economic, diplomatic, and cultural perspectives. The problem is that with several different groups pursuing diverse interests, restitution gradually dissolves into aimless diplomatic politics of economic and power maneuvering. Political theatrics with full media publicity while repatriating a few objects to Africa are choreographed by European museums and European actors to mask the problems militating against restitution six years after Macron's declaration. I'm gonna discuss just some very few of these problems. The first is the politicization of restitution. European actors approach restitution as a matter of geopolitics, but this strategy is not new. Art historian Benedict Savoy reminds us that European countries were receptive to restitution during the Cold War for political reasons as soft power to improve relations with Africa. Brazilian art critic Fran Francesco Bellarini observes that in the 21st century, America and Europe are intensifying those efforts in their desperate attempts to strengthen commercial and political ties with Africa to counter the increasing influence of China and Russia. Now, since Macron's statement came on the trail of his continent tour for that specific political goal, there is validity in author Ido Vox's conclusion that restitution is new, new imperial geopolitics based on Europe's desire of, to salvage influence among African states. This politicization of restitution explains why today we are hearing of loan agreements and museum funding and collaboration with, with researchers instead of, instead of the demands for justice. The second problem 
is what I call the creation of unethical, unethical relations in Africa. Informed by its new imperial ambition, foreign governments and museums engage parallel governments rather than indigenous people. Now, this is causing a lot of chaos in Africa because tricked by this European induced rift, African nations engaged in repatriation euphoria. That is the fixation on the economic dimension of restitution because the Saar and Savoy report implies financial compensation even as it focuses on establishing new ethical relations between Africa and Europe. But paradoxically, the result is the emergence of unethical relations and battles in Africa. Take it, the, from, until recently, for example, Nigeria was, fa was faced with a four-way battle for the ownership of the anticipated Benin bronzes. The Kingdom of Benin, the federal government, the, the Do state government, and the Nigerian-based leg leg Legacy Restoration Trust were locked in a very fierce battle. But this is not unique because the national government, custom officials, the National Museum, Giriyama and Pokomo communities are also locked in their own specific battle in Kenya. We know that after an American museum returned Vigango Post to Kenya, the objects have sat in custom for many years now, awaiting payment of an enormous tariff for their release to the National Museum of Kenya. The other problem with restitution is Africa's uncertainty about restitution. Beside the struggle for ownership, there are discrepancies in African perception of the matter. For example, aware of Macron's deceit, the Malian writer Manthea Diawara declares that we need reparations, not restitution. Togolese artist Titi Akamela Zonko argues that restitution could destroy the continent through economic and international wars for the power to exploit the object's economic values. Art historian Moyo Ikediji perceives that African art should be left in Europe as forensic evidence of the atrocities of colonialism. At the same time, Amadou Bakum, director of the Museum of Black Civilization in Senegal, rejects restitution because he argues it degrades Africa. In his words, I quote, when people say 80% of African artifacts are outside the continent, it is not true. We have artifacts to concentrate on here. We cannot reduce Africa's history to the history of colonialism. Now, the most pressing problem with restitution that a lot of people don't talk about in Europe is what I call the decolonial vacuum. I'm happy that Andreas mentioned part of it in this presentation. Now, restitution emphasis on repatriation fails to define decolonial frameworks for reposition, repositioning African art that will remain in Europe. Those who advocate total or comprehensive repatriation fail to realize that relocating a few objects will not decolonize European museums' coloniality. By coloniality, I mean the thinking of superiority that hierarchizes presentation within the museum space. Currently, according to the Kenyan cultural analyst, Christine Mungai, there are an estimated 70,000 African objects at the Musée du Quai Branley, 69,000 at the British Museum, 37,000 at the World Museum in Austria, 75,000 at the Future Humbug Forum in Germany, as well as 180,000 at the Musée Royal de l'Afrique Centrale in Belgium. Let's face the reality. Many of these art forms will not return to Africa because a lot of them are genuinely owned by Europe. Their con continued presence in animated suspense will preserve the anthropological gaze distorting African culture and history. Now the emphasis on object repatriation obscures many questions. For example, was plundering the continent's artifacts an act of material dispossession, cultural desecration, or epistemicide? Or does the decolonization of African art and European museum follow from the simple act of object relocation? And finally, does returning object to state representatives or other parties rather than indigenous people 
qualify as restitution? My criticism is not that restitution is unnecessary. What I contend with is the Western monologic to restitution centered on, on loan, on objects known, or the construction of museum in Africa. By dictating the question in restitution dialogues, Europe obscures the significant issue of ongoing epistemic violence against Africa, which I mean misrepresentation of African cultures that degrade their histories and people. Therefore, to address colonial injustices ethically, we must approach restitution from two perspectives, tangible and epistemic. Um, Andreas talked earlier of moral. I will talk more about the, from two pers the perspective of tangible and epistemic. Let me start with tangible restitution. By tangible restitution, I refer to artifact repatriation where it is needed. We know that there are areas of blatant plundering. In these cases, we must be talking about restitution, return of those objects without the kind of conditions we see being put in European museums at the moment. Yet, for this to be ethical, we must proceed differently. <coughs> First, Europe should not control the dialogues of restitution. It is hypocritical for the president of France, for example, who has been accused of perpetuating neo-imperialism in Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, Niger, and the Republic of Benin through franc africa policies to lead the charge for restitution. Jonathan Paquette, the chairholder of cultural heritage policies in the Francophone <coughs> world, raises an important question. He asks, should we look to former state institution for ethical restitution? Paquette warns against Europe continuing to detect for Africa what it thinks that Africa actually <coughs> needs. Unfortunately, this is already happening. In February 2022, the news channel France 24 celebrated the return of 26 objects out of 69,000 to the Republic of Benin, not to atone for colonialism, but to promote France's new imperial political ambitions through its 1 billion euro investment initiative to turn the country into a global tourist destination, which is better to offer this country's full decolonization full self-governance or to build museums for them. This, at the same time, the British Museum and the German government have agreed to fund the construction of an Edo Museum of West African art to store the Benin bronzes. So you want to create restitution by determining where the objects should be kept. You know, this is problematic. Through its sudden interest in funding African museums as a precondition for restitution, Europe continues to undermine Africa. Again, for tangible restitution to be successful, restitution should be to the rightful indigenous owners, not governments. Alexander Hammond, assistant director of the Institute for Art and Law, perceived that the success of restitution can only be measured by returning objects to their original homes. In the African context, unless Europe returns the objects to the indigenous owners, the current politicization of repatriation will continue to dispossess them of their revered artifacts. Again, the 26 objects returned to the Republic of Benin are displayed in the presidential palace in Kotoni. However, the objects originate from Abomi, the seat of the former Dahomey Kingdom before the unification of Benin under French. Benin under French colonization. Here, France is simply reconfiguring looting by handing the objects to the president of the Republic instead of the indigenous of Abomey. The same goes for Belgium's decision to ignore Bemba, Tutsi, or Chokwe indigenous and return objects inventories, not the object themselves, to the government in Kinshasa. Now, the second approach to ethical restitution is what I call epistemic restitution. Most importantly, restitution should be about decolonization to expand the relevance of African art globally. Since many African objects will remain in Europe, rethinking their presentation constitutes an ethical approach to decolonizing European museums and the European mind. To achieve this goal, I propose 
a reconceptualization of museology in dealing with African material culture. This proposal to this proposal to rethink African art in Europe reflects the intentions of some African communities. Permit me to quote the thoughts of Nji Maran Chari, the Director of Cultural Affairs at Bamun Palace in Cameroon, concerning the contested Bamun Royal Stool at the Homburg Forum. I quote, some say the Germans stole the crown. Others say it wasn't a gift if it was one, a forced gift. But we think that the Bamun people maintained a marriage of convenience with the Germans. We hope that those ties will be revived through more significant cultural cooperation. <coughs> the Germans will appreciate the mutual benefit of helping preserve our cultural heritage. The throne in Berlin is an ambassador of our rich culture." Unquote. Now, since repatriation accompanied by isolationism, may impede the appreciation of African art as cultural, cultural ambassadors, the answer to ethical restitution lies in developing what I call post-colonial museology. By post-colonial museology, I mean the formulation of decolonial museum practices, including curating, presentation, narration, and public prog programming that critically engaged colonial histories through indigenous objects. That is, practices tailored to de racialize the gaze on indigenous material culture in telling ancient and medieval African stories. To achieve post colonial museology, I propose three conceptual frameworks or interventions for European museums. The first is that European museums must de anthropologize African art. Ethnographic museums invented the anthropological gaze to hierarchize cultures by racializing otherness to contain the other. As mediations of anthropological knowledge, ethnographic museums institutionalize the construction of tribal identities, primitivism, savageness, and barbarism in Africa. Rethinking the future of museums requires first de-anthropologizing African art. The first step, of course, is for European museums to redesignate and relocate African artifacts to classical art galleries. We know that the concept of ethnographic object is an imagined construction through a detachment and disciplinary contextualization. No culture creates all ethnographic objects. There's some guys in the museums that call them ethnographic objects. Continually displaying African artifact artworks in ethnographic museums implies that Europe still sees them as objects of curiosity. It is not just, it is illogical to uphold such misconception in the 21st century. We know that traditional African art introduced Euro-American modernists to implicit conceptualism by parroting the sophisticated formalism of indigenous African art, Picasso, Matisse, Giacometti, Gabo, and others revolutionized European modern art to its sophisticated uh, intellectual pedestal. Since traditional African abstractionism inspired European artworks in, in art museums, curators must relocate African objects from ethnographic collections to galleries designated as classical African art. I use the term classical beyond Greek and Roman situatedness. Classicism is contextualized in this context, first as a historical artistic occurrence during Asian civilization, and second as a philosophy of art. That is art concerned with depicting mythology, spirituality, and religion, particularly the idealization of realism based on social societal specific philosophies. Secondly, European museums to de-anthropologize African art must open them to multiple presentation, not just the perspective of European ethnographers. As the Archie Mafij chair in cultural, in critical humanities and decoloniality, Shahid Bauda proceeds, allowing for multi-violent voices and multi-authorial possibilities to strengthen curating, allowing, allowing curating to contextualize the complex and specific histories and cultures of indigenous people 
is a central decolonial methodology for 21st century museums. In this sense, there's a need for Europe to include African voices and forms of display, such as temporality. Many African objects were not created to be permanently displayed, but only came out occasionally. Secrecy were, and haziness were such most objects were created mainly for specific initiates of court. And when they were made public, they were kept in dark spaces and interactivity. Most objects became of, de derived their artifactuality from being used, like the Aquaba doll, for example, shown on the screen. Digital humanities provides a pathway for such multi-authorial possibilities. For example, augmented reality can transpose viewers in Europe to new depictions of the cultural usage of Aquaba dolls staged by Ghanaian women. Digital humanities in this context will provide a comprehensive experience of their derivative artifactuality, thus liberating them from, their, from anthropological fixation towards more global appreciation. The second conceptual framework to uh, post-colonial museology is for Europe to de-hegemonize and indigenize museum narratives. The rhetorical texts constitute epistemic violence perpetuating injustices towards Africa. The strategy involves a conscious narrative omission that masks colonialism by reinventing objects' histories, explaining why the cultural studies expert Helen Kozal described museum texts as racist, sexist, and biased. If you enter European museums, three typologies of narratives dominate European, European museums concerning African art. The first revolves around glorifying imperial exploitation. It recounts the agency of African indigenous objects in Europe constructed around what the art historian Tejuku called the white savior industrial complex. So we went to Africa, we saw savage people, and we saved their lives by collecting their objects and giving them European civilization. Expert knowledge in position defines the second category leading to the imposition of assumptions on African art. For example, museums' classificatory systems usually group artifacts from the continent according to regions or tribes, defining an object as Bidin, Bende, Sonufo, Bamun, Bambara, or Nok, not minding the flaws that these tribal identifications come from colonial thinking and colonial logic, not the realities in Africa. The most troublesome category is what I call uncritical acknowledgement passed as post-colonial consciousness, where European curators passively, passively reference colonialism without critical implications. I'll give you just two examples, one from the Homburg Forum and one from the House of European History. If you go to the Homburg Forum next to the contested Bamun stool, where the Cameroon objects are displayed, you will find this text on the wall. I quote, the German rule in Cameroon had far-reaching consequences. After the First World War, the colony was divided into French and British mandates. The German past in Cameroon today is remembered differently across the country. In some areas, it is recalled as less harmful than the British and the French rule. In some, in others, the scars of the German rule are remembered vividly, unquote. So to present a post-colonial consciousness to deal with the, the problems of the past, the museums in, invokes comparative analysis that villainizes Britain and France in order to exonerate Germany. The, 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 you, you agree that this is absolute rubbish. If you go to the House of European History on the section on European expansionism, imperialism, you can still see it on their website today. You find this text. The 19th century witnessed a global dominant Europe. Empires expanded, colonies amassed, all pushed energetically forward by the Industrial Revolution. Colonies provided the raw materials and luxury commodities to meet rising consumer, consumer demands. Abuse and inequalities were excused as necessary part of civilizing savage peoples. When you read the text, you will think colonies provided the raw materials as if there was a mutual agreement. Whereas in Congo, 
Children, women, and men were amputated for not providing enough rubber. You, uh, the, the director mentioned the rubber terror. You don't mention that 2,500 people were killed in Ijebude because they were blocking the Brits from entering the hinterlands of, of Western Nigeria to extract palm oil to be used in Liverpool. He also talks about abuse and inequality. Africans were not abused, they were dehumanized. Sarah Batman is one example. To address the problem of a hegemonic narration, Euro, European museums should adopt embodied and polyphonic narratives as epistemic restitution. This starts with acknowledging African voices within the museum space. I was happy to listen to Andreas, Andreas the, the second speaker, who talked about inviting experts and listening to them about what should be included in the museum. Not so with the, the African Museum in Congo. You listen to the speaker, you listen more about, about ecological activism, global warming. This is the view of the West being pushed on Africans, not the thought of Africans within the museum space. But Andreas talked, talked, touched upon it very well, where they are inviting experts. So African voices must be included in the museum space. Museums must stop seeing themselves as the authority of African cultures. And in the words of the former director of Walker Art Center of Blaviso, position themselves as learning communities, not impenetrable centers of self-validating authority. To de-hegemonize de curatorial stories, I propose the following. One, museums should acknowledge individual agencies of a traditional African art. Has it ever occurred to you that you never see the names of African makers in museums? But the, some of the collectors knew the names of the, the makers. I'll give you an example. Josh Haley lives among, the, uh, among the, no, the, the, the mono people for 20 years. He knew the makers. He knew the courts. He knew the carvers who made them. But he never collected the names of the makers to include in his collection. Number two, I don't, I, there's a lot to explain why this is the case. It goes far away to the Cartesian philosophy, where I think, therefore, I am individuality being instituted as the, as the core of European civilization and enlightenment. And they had to deny Africans that, uh, deny Africans that to show that they were not as advanced as Europe. So including the individual names would have gone antithetical to the colonial logic that the people were bounded as simpleton in tribes. Museums should address the issue of misplaced assignation. There are many cases of misplaced assignation where artifacts are given to the uh, assigned to the wrong cultural group. For example, Senufo. Senufo is a very often you see artwork saying Senufo and it's Burkina Faso. But there's Senufo in Mali, there's Senufo in Ghana. It doesn't tell us which, it doesn't show exactly which Senufo tribe these artifacts come from. It is important for curators to genuinely address object wrongful assignation using recorded as for all tribal art. This strategy depicts an ethical acknowledgement of colonial ethnographic imposition, thus pointing to the post-colonial post amends. European museums also must include the perspective of colonial collecting told by Africans to highlight other mutual collecting agencies. This will dispel the misconception that all African objects in European collections were looted. Many Africans think that every African object in European collection was stolen, but this is a blatant lie. And it's also some, one of the lies that a lot of Africans in the diaspora keep pushing. European museums, ex, European, European experts collected objects as gifts. They also bought some and exchanged. So majority of them were not stolen. We can't question the high, high handedness used in some of the collection, but if there are no cases of blatant violence of looting, it is very difficult to think that all objects were looted. Finally, the third framework of post-colonial museology is what I call critical post-colonial presidency. To address the anthropological fixation of ethnographic museums, Europe needs strategic, tangible post-colonial collection and exhibition to bridge the gap in Africa, Africans, Africa's history that they tell in their collections. Africa did not end with the carving of masks or the decoration of calabashes, yet a conscious chasm exists across European museums without modernist, nationalist, and post-independent African art. 
European museums engage in post-colonial pretense by retaining and glorifying empires in permanent collections while selectively displaying specific interest to 20th century African art. I'll give you one example. For example, the Musée Royal de l'Afrique Centrale in Belgium reopened in 2018 with a supposed decolonial outlook to reflect on Belgium's imperial past. A commissioned Congolese artist, Amin Pane, to create a piece for the Grand Rotunde, a giant perforated wooden sculpture, wooden head sculpture, portraying a futuristic hope through a statue that desists from pointing fingers at anyone for the brutalities of Belgian imperialism in Congo was the result of the commission. You can see why the museum funded such a grandiose project in their mind. It aligns with its strategy of masking colonialism by using African artists as baits for portraying superficial decoloniality. Mpane's sculpture sits adjacent to a statue of an African boy clutching, you can see it on your left, uh, clutching, clutching, the, the ropes of a, clutching the ropes of a Belgian missionary with the words, Belgium brings civilization to Congo emboldened on it. Such declaration constitutes ongoing parroting of the misleading assumption that missionaries went to Africa to civilize the natives when they did the opposite. In a letter to church ministers in 1883, King Leopold urged them not to civilize Africans, but to cow them into Western submission. He admonished them to, not, um, he admonished them to teach Africans to read, but not to think or reason, so that they may never become competitors to white. Now, aware of these prejudices, how ethically <coughs> decolonial is the exhibition of a contemporary African sculpture next to a statue with such a fallacious claim that celebrates white supremacy? Recently, Laura Nsengewuva described the museum's invitation <coughs> to Africa for dialogues and research, which uh, Bart spoke with earlier. She described it as colonial propaganda 2.0. Her proposal of a giant melting ice statue of King Leopold II to represent the fading of white supremacist ideologies in Belgium was vehemently rejected, <coughs> and she was also attacked by the museum management. To resolve Europe's post-colonial pretense, I make two suggestions. Exhibit Africa's modernist and anti-colonial art. The 1900s and 1970s marked the sophisticated intersection of art, indigenous resistance, anti-colonialism, and nationalism throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Aino Nabil, <coughs> Sanu Mkiru, Ibrahim El Salahi, Ernest Makomba, and many others drew impetus from Pan-African and liberation movement. Thus, their art provides ethical, critical, alternative narratives to colonialism which will educate European audiences about colonialism seen through the eyes of the colonized, not the diaries of experts or the knowledge of ethnographers within the museum space in order to correct the distorted history of African and European museums. Number two, curate the contemporary in critical post-coloniality. Curators must stop the subjective display of African art that forces them into hegemonic global narratives. Museums showcase works produced by Africans that are, that are critical of Africa, but not critical of the West. They use robust patronage to extend hegemonies by exhibiting the works of the likes, the likes of Ella Nasi, the likes, the likes of Ella Nasi, uh, Goncalo Mabunda and others to subsume their practices into highlighting the neoliberal politics of global warming and Africa's supposed guilt and devastation. You see, we are talking about restitution, and we had the director talking about ecological activism, uh, uh, the emission of carbon, and the preservation of the environment. This selective activism silences critical voices, with Europe using Africans as objects of knowledge while continuing to display them as unthinking. Exhibiting challenging artworks without conceptual alteration is, a crucial, is crucial for European museums if they are to become truly universal. In conclusion, I want to reiterate that repatriation is not restitution or decolonization. 
thus implementing this tangible and ep tangible, whether it's moral, epistemic restitution proposal constitutes a path to ethicality. In particular, post-colonial museology will help European museums create horizontal histories of civilizations towards what the Puerto Rican sociologist Ramon Grisfogol calls universality, or what the Greek social theorists, or, or what the Latin American philosopher calls Eric, Eric de Sob describes as transmodernity, or what the Greek social theorist Kyriakos Kontapolos refers to as heterarchies, and the British American philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah describes as cosmopolitanism. Having said this, I want to acknowledge the progressive work done by the National Museum of Scotland and the Rich Museum in the Netherlands to de-racialize their displays. It suffices in conclusion that what we need is collaboration, not antagonism between Africa and Europe in achieving this new vision for museums in post-imperial Europe. Thank you very much for listening. Gracias, Clemen. Quiero aprovechar porque antes no lo he dicho que Clemen. Uh, we'd like to take advantage of the fact that uh, Clement is from Nigeria. He works in the Advanced Institute of the European University. Now we open a Q&A if anybody is interested in debating and questioning some of the things he has said. Hello. Good afternoon. I think you, you have a very critical stance and perspective, and it's logical. It makes sense. But I want to ask you a question. You belong to the Museistic world. Do you recognize the works of art that were plundered from Africa? But do you recognize the work done by museums, archaeologists? Do you realize all the economic effort and professional effort that has been made for hundreds of years? Because in a way, do you recognize this? Do you see it? Have you thought about this when you talk about restitution? Because you are asking that Europe should recognize all this. But are you also thinking about recognizing this work that has been done in Europe? I'm just thinking about the work being done and the economic effort and everything that has been done, legitimate or not. Absolutely. Can I answer now? Absolutely. Thank you very much for that question. If you listen to my presentation, the way I've made my presentation, I'm very critical about, I'm very critical towards those who argue for complete repatriation. Because the first point I will make is that there's a misconception people think that all objects in European collections were looted. This is not true at all. This is, this is a false assumption. There's also a false assumption that is also uh, parroted that 80% of African cultural heritage are in Europe. This is a lie, of course. This is not correct. I grew up in Africa. I see, I see African works. There's a lot of African works as scourge of people. There are many reasons why people don't have any interest in those works in Africa. One of it has to do with religion, Christianity. Of course, I recognize, I recognize this, the work done by Europe. That is why. I am very, I'm very supportive of the concept of the Universal Museum. But my argument is that this has to be through collaboration. I'm also very supportive of the concept of loans and even reprises. I mean, very supportive. But what I'm critical about is if we are talking about loans, let it come, let the, the charge or the discussion be led by Africans, but let it not be an imposition by Europeans. Of course, there's something I took out from my presentation. The reason why we are talking about this African art is because Europe preserved the object to their, to their economic value and cultural and universal significance. There are so many objects in Africa, but nobody pays any attention to this object. So of course, I acknowledge and really respect the work that Europe has done. Do I think that all African art should go to Africa? No, of course. But the ones that are questionable and problematic, there should be a dialogue whether to return them 
And if the people still return them, then you can discuss loan agreement, but let it come from them and not uh, Europe. Because if we continue to allow Europe to impose, then we are extending new imperialism and hegemonies rather than having a dialogue that we should continue to have. The uh, director Bart made a statement where he talked about he talked about changing, beginning to talk about partners in Africa. It is important to, to have partners as, a, as opposed to having Africans as subjects of Europe, of knowledge, where you just go to Africa and tell them, look, I want you to research on this. I want you to research on this. And we know for the past 70 years or 50 years, whenever we have those discussions, it has been Europe telling Africans what to do as opposed to having a collaboration. I support the concept of uh, uh, universal museums. I acknowledge the work done by Europeans and also acknowledge that Europe owns a lot of the objects in Africa because in Europe uh, owns a lot of the objects in their collection from Africa. Africa doesn't have the documentation to show that everything was looted. Eso. Primero, first of all, I will that uh, y para que entiendan so everybody can understand I feel lucky to be in the African Museum to because I was surprised about the number because it's a museum of Congo the name says a lot not the number so some of the impressions of this museography and the museum that nowadays I have confirmed by listening to you. And I'm very hopeful to see that there are other discourses and narratives. And the most important thing is not so much to remain in this debate of restitution, but to recognize both parts and especially why this legacy is here. One of the things that I was surprised about was the absence of Afro-descendants. It was like a museography, clearly propagandistic, even nowadays. Therefore, of course, you have a much more global vision, including many more museums. But I don't know if you know if there is any European proposal in order to, within the many Afro descendants who are in Europe, I don't know, there can be some consensus taking into account the legal framework in Europe. I don't know if this is a utopia. Oh, not only a debate, but also a legislation which can be of this European present something real, not only in the objects, but uh, also in the dialogue and the practice. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, like you rightfully say, there's a lot of prop propagandistic display um, that I feel that I feel that requires a lot of change, but at the moment I'm not seeing that change in Europe. I, I mentioned that I, sh I mentioned the Museum of Scotland. The reason why I mentioned the Museum of Scotland is that they had an exhibition called Exhibition of World Cultures in 2021. In that culture, in that exhibition, the curators refused to organize the works according to tribes or co or nations, but rather according to themes and materiality. So when you go there, you see world cultures without hierarchies, but you see what the, what I, I, the, uh, Ricard de Soeur would call transmodernity or pluriversality, horizontal telling of histories. But we don't see that in Europe. And this is very problematic. America is well advanced. One of the questions I wanted to ask, but I didn't want to take, wanted to take chance of the audience members was uh, Andreas. Andreas, if you listen to Andreas, he has a completely different perspective towards what has to be done in the museum. And I, don't, I wanted to ask if it's because of the advancement of decolonial thinking in, the, in America, influencing that dis decision, which we don't have in Europe at the moment. I'll give you something I've, I've, not, I've not seen, I hope to see a, a kind of 
framework developed within, um, uh, within Europe to rethink completely how we look at ethnographic and other uh, ethnological object or art, indigenous art. I've not seen that. I hope to see that. Or maybe there is, I'm not aware. I want to give you an instance with the policy or the guideline for restitution. Both the one in France and in Belgium, it states something. All societies or communities or nations asking for restitution must provide evidence of ownership. Evidence of ownership. I want to give you an example of what happened in Benin, where thousands of Benins were killed and the works were forcefully taken away and the, the place was burnt down. Where do you want the people to get the evidence? That shows you clearly that Africa cannot provide that evidence because Africa doesn't have the evidence. Number two, Africa, until the coming of Europeans, operated with oral history, not documented writing. So when objects were artifacts or objects were passed from one, one, one generation to the other, both the stories surrounding the object and the ownership were transferred through oral history. Where do you want the evidence, the documented evidence of ownership? So the, I'm only bringing that part to tell you that you, within Europe, even what we call dialogues is still one-sided. And then finally, the problem we have with European museums is that the decolonial perspective of the new ways we want to reimagine museums in Europe is coming from within the museum itself. I'll give you uh, um, uh, the, um, the American womanist and activist Audrey Lord says that you cannot, the master's tool cannot dismantle the master's house. So you cannot stay within the museum and rethink the museum functioning by yourself. Olufemi Taiwo, a philosopher in the US, says that when you privilege voices within the museums, you actually end up marginalizing those who are already marginalized. marginalized. So whoever asked that question is a fantastic question. I haven't seen, I'm, here, I'm hoping to see, I've seen somebody called um, Truverin, or so, I'm not sure of the exact name, but she wrote, she did a wonderful research where she talked about the problems consigning ethnographic objects, but those solutions and those concerted dialogues I haven't seen yet. There is a project anchored in the University of um, Edinburgh, led by one, one, a, a professor called Karen, it's called De Decolonize or Decenter. It's a fantastic, fantastic organization, but again, it's operating from the margins, the periphery, not within the museum. We need this conversation within the museum space to make both epistemic policy and practical changes within the museum I haven't seen yet, but I hope to see. And maybe we are all having the conversation now. I have a question for Clement. My greetings once again. I'm Celeste. First of all, just to congratulate you for your talk. It was a very stimulating uh, conference, and I think we've taken a lot of notes, although you cannot see very clearly the context of the room. My question is about one question that you have pointed to at the beginning of your conferences, which deals about the instrumental political uses in the context of this debate of restitution. For example, in France, they have used this uh, concept of restitution in order to try to recover influence in some areas of uh, Francophone Africa. And it is also true that the question of restitution fits within a movement of repair claimants, which is much wider, cancelling debt, uh, economic compensation, etc. But out of all these demands, which are much more structural, the question of restitution, the question is about restitution. And I don't know why you think restitution has been prioritized instead of other structural demands. Maybe it was simpler and maybe talk about the question of the industry of uh, colonization. Is it because it's easier to speculate with museums? And nobody 
can forget the fact that the technological missions were in decay and with the questions of decolonization, they have been revitalized. Maybe these speculative aspects can be part of this reading and interpretations, a global uh, perspective on repair and why the question of reception has taken a much bigger centrality. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for that question. I wish I could see the whole, the, the room. Yeah, so my, my, my concern earlier on was that, that reparation, uh, repatriation has been prioritized instead of, instead of restitution. So the, the Europe makes it look as if, if we return, in fact, I call it material missionaries. If we return a few objects, then oh, you're going to keep quiet and give you some money to build some museums. The, the reason is simple, right? African nations, particularly the politicians, when you give them the money, of course, if you go to give somebody $35 billion, $35 million, that is a lot of money to construct a museum, and with few objects, of course, they will take it. Now, the reason why repatri repatriation in the context of the museum is very intense and serious, where, whereas other aspects of colonialism has been marginalized or, or put to the background, is because museums have the tangible evidence of colonialism. They have the tangible evidence of racism. They have the tangible evidence of expropriation. And then they have the tangible evidence of ongoing, what I call epistemic violence, which is the misrepresentation. Other aspects of colonialism, of course, it is there, but without this tangible evidence, people cannot claw on it. But people can see the museum, and they can see the object, and of course, that gets them all riled up, and then it amplifies, it amplifies agitation. So it's a fantastic question. I think it's poly repatriation, for me, is a very political stuff, because once you return a few objects and build museums, then people are going to keep quiet. I want to give the person that asked the question an example. In 2000, in 2000, and in 2000, in March, the Benin Kingdom wrote a letter to the British Museum and asked for two things. Return all our objects to us, or give us the financial equivalent of their contemporary monetary value. They never mentioned the building of museums. But all of a sudden, the construction of museums to store venerated objects when they are returned, whatever that time is, is now the center stage of the discussions about restitution. So we cannot repair the past alone. We cannot repair the past if Europe dominates. In fact, Ohakinemo oh 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 argues that a thief, a thief cannot dictate for the owner of the object is stole where to keep the object. So you're right, you're absolutely right. I think that repat repatriation, because it can, it can drag people's attention and when some financial compensation follows, it will make everybody interesting and people, once they touch money, they're gonna keep quiet. And I feel that museums are the, are the center of this discourse because you have the tangible evidence. There are other aspects, I gave you an example of uh, Dukas the art from the beginning of my presentation. It's there as well. Because if, like the director said, there's a lot of racism still going on, but he mentioned of somebody, a member of their team being attacked. Nobody talks about that because nobody sees it. But people talk about the cast the art because they can see the savage character coming up every August, every year. So when there's tangible evidence, agitation is amplified. When there's no tangible evidence, then it is easy to sweep colonialism and its legacies to the carpet. I also want to mention, Celeste, that in case you need the transcript, transcript of what I've said, I can send it to you immediately when we finish. If anybody is interested, by the way, I'm not sure anybody is, but if anybody's interested, I can send the, the transcript to you. A final reflection, final comment. It's not for the speaker, although thank you very much for your comments. My question, by closing this cycle of repairing the past, the Ethnologic Museum, which are the tasks that are being carried out in this framework, I would like to know, besides yesterday, the project you presented, uh, to which the museum belongs, the museum in itself, is organizing any of these tasks, or are you preparing? <laughs> 
for this. So this is a question for me. The Ethnological Museum of Barcelona, you mean? No, I, I, I am not the museum, but I work at the museum, yes. Well, here I have to say something, and I don't agree with what, what was been said before by our colleagues, which is the consideration of artistic objects and also a series of pieces and work of art that we have in the museum, which in reality are uh, forebringers of discourses, beliefs, myths, ceremonies, which do not belong to contemporary culture but happen somewhere else. So they represent communities that are alive, and this is part of their heritage history, patrimonial history. Why am I saying that? Because we have to distinguish between our museum, which is a museum like a typical one that you will find in Europe, which was created to glorify uh, colonies, therefore uh, European action in the colonies. This is not our case. In our case, it will be a bit long to explain the history of this museum, but this cannot be compared with the Tamburen African Museum or on a, other types of museums. Why am I saying all this? And I will try to answer your question now. We are very worried about creating and working on the imaginary, the social representations that we have right now. And I'm not only speaking from the European perspective, I'm speaking about plural societies, communities, through immigration, they have been established in our society. Therefore, we have to create these courses much more coherent with the reality that we are facing. On the other hand, of course, this means to decolonize our mindsets, so our, our welcoming society. And we think that a found of objects such as the one we have here, representing a huge diversity, can contribute to, with the participation of other communities, creating these imaginary groups, new social representations that, in other words, will be the ones allowing not only to explain who we are, where do we come from, but who are the others and how to belong to this new society. And this is why when you were speaking about converting all these objects into artistic objects, to me, this has a totally new dimension because these objects are not valued just because of their aesthetic aspects or symbolic aspects, but in reality, to us, these are instruments that create this new imaginary. I hope I've made myself clear. In this case, I would just like to thank you very much, Emeka, for your intervention, which has been very clarifying and interesting and has introduced a lot of elements that have truly enriched our conversation. And we will be, of course, very, very happy and grateful uh, for you to send the transcript of your presentation. So without further ado, we will now close this session. And we hope that in the future, we will have the opportunity to meet again in similar circumstances. Thank you again, Emeka. With these words, we close the session of this third edition of our international seminars. Thank you.